Hello and welcome back. And as always, I thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady. Today we consider part 11 in our measure theory series. And as promised, it will be about the proof of Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. I already told you, this is one of my favorite theorems and you will see that the proof is indeed not so hard. Okay, then let's recall the theorem from the last part of the series. Here you see all the assumptions we need for Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. On the one hand, we have a sequence of measurable maps and also the pointwise limit function, which we will call just f. And on the other hand, we have another function g, which is integrable. And this function g is indeed the important ingredient in the whole theorem. It should lie above all the functions fn and therefore we call it an integrable measurement. From these nice assumptions, we now can conclude that all the functions in the sequence are also integrable. And moreover, also the mu almost everywhere pointwise limit function f is also integrable. From this we can conclude that all these integrals here make sense. And the equality tells us that we can pull in the limit into the integral. And that's the reason we call it a convergence theorem. Well, then let's start with the proof. The ingredients we need for the proof are on the one side properties of the integral and also on the other hand Fatou's lemma. From the properties of the integral we can immediately show the first property here. Please recall that lying in L1 means that the absolute value of fn has a finite integral. Please remember we have measurable maps and this is a non-negative function, therefore the integral always exists, but in the worst case it could be infinity. Therefore lying in L1 means this is not infinity, so smaller than infinity. Okay, now we can use our assumption. We know that we have an integrable measurement called g. So we have an inequality here and you remember we have a monotonicity property of the integral. This means we also have the inequality in the integral sense. So let's put that to the left. And then I know this is less or equal than the integral of g. Now note that this right hand side is indeed our assumption that the integral of g is indeed finite. Our conclusion is now this integral is also finite. And this means all the fn lie in L1. Obviously we can do the same for f instead of fn because we know it's a pointwise limit almost everywhere. Therefore this inequality holds almost everywhere. And of course also almost everywhere the monotonicity property still holds, which means we get the same inequality here for the integral of f. Or in other words, we also have f in L1. Okay, very good. So what you have seen now is that the first part in the theorem was very easy to show. Hence, the crucial thing in the theorem is indeed this convergence statement here. Okay, so this is what we do in the next five minutes. And indeed, I want to show something a little bit more stronger. We will show that the integral of the absolute value of fn minus the pointwise limit f goes to zero if n goes to infinity. And from this we can immediately conclude the property we want here. However, let us start showing this property here. Okay, in the integral we have the function fn minus f but in the absolute value. Now we know that for the absolute value going a detour makes it greater or in the best case it stays the same. Now going the detour to zero this means we have here absolute value of fn plus 
the absolute value of f. This is just the triangle inequality for the absolute value when we read it point wisely. This means we could put in axes here for the functions. But it holds for all the axes, therefore this is just the short notation we use. Also what we know is that we have our major in g for fn and also for f as I told you. Therefore we have this as less or equal than 2g. 1g plus 1g. Now you could say this inequality only holds mu almost everywhere. However, it does not matter at all because the integral does not see changes that happen almost uh, nowhere, uh, which is the complement of almost everywhere. Therefore, we could change or choose another function g where this inequality here does indeed hold everywhere. Hence, we can assume that we do this here and therefore I can omit the mu almost everywhere and it makes the proof just shorter. Okay, now I can bring this on the other side and I get out a non-negative function I want to call hn. So this would be 2g minus our absolute value fn minus f and we know it's non-negative. Obviously this holds for all n and we know by the properties of measurable functions that hn is also measurable. Now I have written that down in such a way that you should recognize immediately Fatou's lemma. Simply because we have measurable functions and they are all non-negative. Therefore now we can apply Fatou's lemma. Fatou's lemma tells us something about the limit inferior. So lim inf. Namely, it tells us that we can look at the integral of the lim inf and we can pull it out with an inequality sign. In fact, it's possible that it gets bigger if we pull the lim inf outside. However, the inequality always holds and that is what we can need here. Of course, you should ask yourself, do we know the lim inf here and here? Maybe we should look first on the left hand side. Inside the integral it always means the pointwise limit. Now it's the pointwise lim inf, but we know that the pointwise limit of hn indeed exists. And therefore it should be the same as the lim inf. Okay, so let's write that down. We know this is the integral of our pointwise limit of hn. 2g is 2g, but we know f is the pointwise limit of fn and therefore this one is 0. So only 2g remains here. Okay, then let's look at the right hand side. There we have the integral of hn. However, the integral is linear, so we have indeed two integrals, one of 2g and the other one of our fn minus f in the absolute value. For the first part, the lim inf does not matter, so we can write down immediately we have 2g here. Then for the second part, you have to be careful. Yeah, we subtract something positive and we look at the lim inf, yeah, which means uh, to get out the lim inf, we have to subtract the lim sub, the limit superior. Or maybe in other words, if you want to find the smallest outcome here, yeah, as a non-negative number, yeah, you have to subtract here the biggest possible number. Okay, so this explains why we have the lim sub here, but we don't change the integral at all, so this is fn minus f the mu. Okay, with the left hand side here and the right hand side here, we have a very nice inequality. If I then add what I missed before here, so the mu and our x, then you will recognize the ability that we have the same on the left and the right here. Of course, now you should subtract the same thing on both sides. If we do this, we find 0 on the left, obviously, and only this part here on the right hand side, so minus our lim sub. 
Okay, so the minus sign is not so beautiful. Therefore, I want to bring this on the other side, which means we now have the inequality here on the right, which means this would be without the minus sign less or equal than zero. Okay, so now please note, this is very interesting. The limb sub of non-negative numbers should be non-positive. Hence, from this, we can conclude that the limit exists. We do this in the following way. We say, okay, I have the limb sub here, so this is always greater or equal than the limb inf. Of course, this holds for all sequence of numbers. The limb inf is always less or equal than the limb sub. But still, we have non-negative numbers here. Therefore, the limb inf should be also non-negative. So we have this inequality here. This one here is now always nice. We have inequalities, but on the left is the same as on the right. This simply means that all the inequalities here are in fact equalities. There is simply no other way, which means the limb inf is equal to the limb sub, which means the limit exists and is equal to this limb sub and limb inf, which is zero. So let's write it down, limit exists and the limit of this integrals is equal to zero. Well, this is what we wanted to show. And I explained before, this is a stronger result than that what we have in Lebesgue's theorem. But I will now show you how we get to the result in Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. Okay, let's do that now. So we want to show that the limit of the functions in the integral is equal to the integral of our function f. Therefore, we can look at the difference and in the absolute value and show that this goes to zero for n to infinity. Okay, the first part we can note is this is also non-negative because it's an absolute value. And in the next steps, we can use the properties we already know from the integral. For example, the linearity. So we know this is indeed just one integral where we have fn minus f in the integral itself and the absolute value around. Now in the next part, we use something that is also called triangle inequality, but here now for integrals, which means now put the absolute value inside and then we can get bigger or stay the same. Here we now reach something that we already know, at least in a limit. So it goes to zero for n to infinity. Hence the last step we need here now is just a small sandwich theorem. Now in a limit we have the zero left and right and therefore we know this limit also exists and is equal to zero. And therefore the whole thing in the absolute value has a limit and is equal to zero. So putting that on the other side, we now can conclude limit of the integrals of fn is equal to the integral of f. And here you see, this is the convergence statement that we wanted to prove in the beginning. And that was the proof of Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. I already told you this part dominated is the important ingredient for the theorem because we need such an integrable majorant. We call this majorant just g, but you saw we need this and then we can apply Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. If you want to see some applications of this theorem, please let me know, because this could be a very good idea for the next part in this series. So thank you very much and see you next time. Bye.